All right, so I'll hopefully caffeinated enough again, ready to go. Uh, uh, in this talk, uh, continuing on the theme of matrix estimation, I want to discuss um, uh, matrix estimation view of uh, some of the causal inference methods. Uh, now again, causal inference has many uh, shapes and forms. Uh, this is one specific view of the causal inference, especially in the context of you're trying to do causal inference with uh, observational data. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the reasons we got interested into this is because uh, it's utility in the context of cricket. And uh, of course, here potentially nobody really needs the introduction to cricket. Okay, so with that, uh, I'll skip a few slides which are introduction to cricket. Um, this is based on, uh, we started with the uh, thesis of uh, Mohammed Jahangir Amjad, who is now at Google, and Dennis Shen, who is still at MIT, and uh, Vishal Mishra is a professor of computer science at Google. Oh, okay, so somehow this is not cool. Oh, I didn't switch it on. So, uh, just to sort of set the context, right, I'll start with a few simple questions whose answer most likely everybody knows much better than me. Uh, so if you have a question like, how do you decide drug A is more effective, more effective than drug B, or comparing ad creatives in an uh, online setting, or better recommendations, depending on if you think of re better recommendations as algorithmic choices, questions that which one is better, these are classical questions, and well, cl these classical questions have very simple but profound answer, as we know, is randomized control, of course, in the context of uh, uh, clinical studies, is a randomized control trial, or RCT is like a protocol, it's a like sort of an internet protocol, it's like it become like uh, enshrined in uh, stone or something. There's a rich history here, uh, short of the long, as we know, is that we take a representative population from which we choose a random subset of, let's say, 100 things, out of which we choose random 50 to A and random 50 to B, track behavior of both of these, let's say, drug A and drug B, for the purpose of metric that you care about over some time. And after that, you ask the question, distributionally, is one better than another? And that's, in fact, it boils down to a hypothesis testing problem. Right? And that's where the p-values and all that come. Uh, we're all uh, on the same page. This is great. All right, so let's sort of ask similar questions, but in a little different setting. So, uh, very relevant. Uh, I mean, independent of what your view and what my view is, we don't need to discuss that part, because then the talk will end. Uh, but let's say we say that, let's, pragmatically, uh, instead of looking at sort of what's going to, what's happening in Parliament, Pragmatically, if we ask question, will this have any impact? And now you and I have to define impact. We can sort of define a measure, a metric that we can measure. Uh, and then to have a question like, what will happen in the next three years? So you might say, okay, well, that's easy. Let's take, uh, let's take sort of Kashmir. Uh, in one version of Kashmir, we implement Article 370. There's another version of Kashmir in which we don't implement Article 370 and let them evolve over the next 10 years and see what happens. Right? I mean, of course, as, as you can say, it's a kind of a nonsense answer because you only want Kashmir. So you see the point, right? That is, uh, these are the settings which are where you can't A, experiment. It's basically observational study, but only one reality. You don't have counterfactuals, you have factuals. Either you have factual, you don't have counter, or you have counterfactuals, but you don't have both. You don't have A versus B. Okay, so you can't do randomized control. Uh, the same question happens in the, let's say, uh, standard setting like, uh, uh, I got introduced to this problem because of this type of question. We're trying to sort of uh, advise different retailers to put their different assortments in their stores, like different types of products, and we're trying to do that algorithmically as a software solution. And if you're selling somebody a solution, somebody will say, well, uh, how do I know it worked? You say, okay, that's great. You have a New York store, implement my solution in New York store, and at the end of the year, what you do is that you see what is your revenue compared to last year's revenue. If it's increased, I'll say, see, I did it. But if you're a critique and you don't want to pay me after a year, you'll say, well, that's, that's 
useless because my sales associates worked very hard, the economy got really better, that's why it happened. This difference in difference is kind of not going to work. You can do the argument other way around. Uh, revenue goes down to save my face, I'll say, well, economy went down. And then you will say, um, uh, you know, no, actually, it didn't work. I said, well, if you didn't use my solution, you would have been even worse. Uh, so we can sort of uh, rationalize different ways. And of course, in the cricket, uh, as we know, DLS or Duckworth Lewis done is an interesting uh, causal inference problem. That is, what if I, instead of this, I have those many overs to play, what would happen? Right? Okay, uh, and like sometimes people get confused. That it's not the insect, it's the game, right? But I mean, not with this audience. Uh, I thought that this is a really useful, in case sort of you speak to somebody from the other side of the world and they're still sort of confused cricket for insect. This is a useful Google query, in case you have not done it. It's just that sort of, it also shows that the sort of world is uh, pretty polarized, which parts, uh, which two and a half of seven billion or so does that. Okay, that's my spill on cricket. Okay, so this is the reason why we can't do randomized control or any such method. Question is that, what do you do? Okay, and again, the point is difference in difference methods or things like that have fundamental issues and flaws. So uh, here's a very interesting answer. Um, my colleague, Alberto Abadi, um, uh, in 2003, so in econometrics, this has been around for a while. Uh, what Alberto Bardi in his thesis, uh, uh, he was a student at MIT as well, uh, and now he's a professor in economics at MIT. Uh, he formalized or he algorithmatized a method that econometricians use to use an expert. The thick view is simple that, say, I have New York, uh, that, that I'm going to implement something. I don't have two New Yorks, but why don't I figure out another such, let's say, city or another store, let's say San Francisco for that matter. It's bad a comparison, but let's have it for that degree. San Francisco, store in San Francisco in Union Square is roughly as good as the store in New York in Union Square. Right? So why don't we have those intervene store in New York, don't intervene store in San Francisco, and then compare their performance side by side. And then see sort of uh, which one is doing better. Okay. In some sense, you created this virtual or synthetic control where the name is derived. But mostly this were done through what's called the matchings or matching studies or matching uh, units. And they were done as uh, through experts. So the experts have made decisions. And also there was like unit to unit. New York may not be exactly equal to San Francisco, which is true. It might be that New York is uh, a San Francisco plus LA minus, um, Boston is pretty cool, so let's not, I was gonna do minus. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but you go along the lines. Let's say Houston, not Boston. All right, or Atlanta. <laughs> no, uh, okay, but the point is that uh, if you are sort of, for example, doing something like uh, uh, Massachusetts, California, New York minus this, this might be one way to sort of produce a weighted combination, and this is weighted combination for the purpose of the metric that you care about. Okay? And the question is, how do you do it? Somehow you want a method to be simple data driven. We'll discuss that in detail. But, Short of the long is this was the this was the extremely simple, okay, but pretty profound answer. And uh, this has been used as a as a standard go-to method in all sorts of policy evaluation uh, literature uh, and in practice right now. I mean, more so in practice. So if you look at uh, Gates Foundation, the way it's trying to figure out whether its dollars are working well or not, they use theory control. Okay. Um, um, uh, when we were trying to sort of sell retail software solution, that's how, by running synthetic control, we sort of convinced people that actually it works or does not work. Uh, most policy evaluation, like right now, there are lots of uh, studies going on where they're trying to argue that uh, this, uh, the legalization of uh, recreational drugs in the United States 
actually is uh, not impacting the way sort of critiques are trying to argue. And to do that in data driven manner, again, this kind of uh, utilized in R. So it's, it's been uh, extremely influential. Okay, if you try to advertise on Google as, a, let's say, one, uh, uh, you're a small boutique business and you try to run Google uh, ads, you have sort of a budget of $100 and you want to argue, Google wants to evaluate that how did that actually help you? They're on synthetic control to sort of show you that sort of, if you did not spend $100, this is what your, uh, your click rate or conversion or what. By spending $100, this is how it has changed. So all of their synthetic control is used, um, and uh, that's basically the idea. So, yeah, I'll tell you in a second. Thank you. Uh, I have not told you the algorithm, but this is the intuition. Um, so again, sort of uh, the earliest one that sort of that did, and which was one of the really interesting case study then in 2003 and then 2010, is there was this article. Uh, Proposition 99 was passed in California. What it did is the following. It said that on every cell of uh, uh, tobacco thing, primarily cigarettes, there was certain tax that was imposed, and that tax uh, revenue will be used to do certain other things. And then the question was that, did that actually change how people sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, how consumed the tobacco? And now again, you can take either side, whether it was good or bad. At least factually, you can ask the question. And here's what happened. So here is the true changes. This is where sort of actually where intervention happened. And this dash, dash, dash line is a synthetic control. An algorithm I'll tell you in a second. Now, if you look at this visually, what you would conclude visually is that, uh, yeah, after intervention, sort of uh, what was expected versus what was actually happened, things changed. Now, before this, what people used to do is something like this, where this was the true um, uh, consumption in California, and this was the na national average. Well, I mean, from this, how can you tell that sort of actually any change happened or not here, right? Because, hey, they were away here, maybe they were departed here already, so maybe there's something else that changed the, all of that. So something meaningful needed. And one way to think of national average is like, uh, uh, like an averaging, which is like randomized control, effectively. Think that I'm one and all the other units are roughly like me, all the other states are roughly like me, and then I'm going to take average consumption. Growth. So randomized, basic randomized control does not work. You need to reweight them somehow. And this is what it's trying to do. Question is that how do you do weights? I'll have to have a second. But uh, here's another one. Uh, Alberto is from uh, Spain and he was truly interested in understanding that uh, see, there was a, uh, there were a bunch of things that happen in the northern part of Spain, uh, if you know that part, the history of that part, in particular it was called Basque Country. He's from that region and he was interested in knowing whether terrorism truly impacted the economic growth of uh, that part of the country. And actually, uh, it started somewhere around. So I think the first was 1968, uh, and then so there was a little bit of sparse, and then around 1970 it took off, or it's something here, and then so, separation. And they, in very careful manner, they argued that why uh, these two things are significantly different. That is, indeed, terrorism impacted the GDP. All right, now, this method, again, I'll describe in a second, it's great, but it is kind of fragile, and fragile in the sense that if data is corrupted or data is noisy or data has missing values, uh, this is what happens. So it's the same data set, if this is from original paper, we recreated this. And if you try to create synthetic control, but with, let's say, a very small fraction of missing values, uh, this is what happens. This is kind of uh, completely catastrophic, uh, visually and actually, <laughs> in, um, in a sort of uh, evaluation. Book. So you need some robustness. Uh, but let's say if you use matrix estimation, which I'll again describe in a second, then this is what you get. There is no matter what fraction of data is missing, how much noise you add, it will sort of remain robust. And you will recreate as if it was you had original access to it. That's correct. So this is a, this is a very good, um, uh, uh, very detailed and meaningful way to do data-driven hypothesis testing like 
um, sort of cross validations to derive some kind of a, let's call it virtual p values and so on. Okay, so now it's a little formalism. Okay, so let's say this is the target metric that you care about, and these are all the donor units in this time, and these are the values that you care about. For example, uh, if you cared about uh, tobacco consumption, uh, then this is that number, some normal idea. So effectively, these are different time series. Uh, the rows correspond to different um, donors or units. Again, going back to this is New York store. Let's say these are the weekly transaction sales. These are different stores, let's say a San Francisco store, Houston store, and so on. You are interested in this one. This is the time before intervention, and this is the time after intervention. If you believe in them, if you believe in them, sure. Um, so uh, this is the time when it's uh, uh, intervention. This is before, and this is after. Before intervention, everything is in the same contextual state, so to speak. After intervention, all of these are not intervened, but this one is intervened. So what you're going to see is you're going to see the outcome of time uh, subject to intervention. And what you want to do is that you want to figure out what would have happened if you had not intervened. And again, you are going to observe these things without intervention. So somehow you want to say, well, knowledge of this will help me sell this. Now you already see, right? It's like a, a specific version of matrix estimation. That is, I've got a matrix, I've got entries here, let me get rid of both. Fill those missing values. That's one view. Um, that works all right, but actually sort of doing a little bit more post-processing actually helps. So I'll describe that in a second. All right, so before I go, again, I'll use the same uh, latent variable model that we had assumed. Nice thing is that if you do the rank two version of this model, that's what econometricians assume as uh, the standard vanilla go-to model. So, so in economics uh, speak, this would, or econometric space, this is a generalized vector model. Okay, and Ah, um, yeah, so, um, so the type of model, at least in this literature, that's used, uh, you, have, uh, you have a feature associated with time. It's called lambda. You have a feature associated with the, um, with the donors. Okay, let's call it mu t. And then you've got inner product of that. Okay, so when you put everything together, what you can do is you can effectively decompose that as a two vector, a ve vector of two dimension for associated both time component and uh, the space component. Time component will have one thing, which is let's say lambda t comma one, and another one, this one will be little sort of algebraic manipulation of everything. And then of course there will be um, there will be uh, the idiosyncratic noise that is model that is zero. So this is like a noisy observation, this is the ground. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> now you can say, behind all of these kind of things, right, if latent function is nice, if your feature space is uh, lower dimensional, then you expect that for type of discussions we've done in, in the earlier lecture, whether to precise calculation or to, uh, to you know, uh, trusting each other, that these kind of matrices under, let's say, nice functions, like Lipschitz functions and analytic functions, are well approximated by low rank structure. If that was the true, and if this model was the true model for that kind of data sets, that, that data set must have reasonable spectrum, right? So you can actually do that. Uh, so California Proposition 99 data set, that is all rows are different states and columns are tobacco sales over yearly tobacco sales. That's matrix, and then you can do uh, this is how it looks, uh, depending on your uh, your thing. What is the rank of this matrix? Well, definitely not larger than five. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, that's for Basque country data set. 
definitely not larger than three. This is really, really low rank structures. And uh, here is sort of how the algorithm works. So I want to figure out what these values are. Uh, using all the data I have here, here's what we'll do. First, we'll ignore the blue part, remove the blue row, take the rest of the gray matrix, that is before and after intervention, but entire matrix. Do your favorite matrix estimation. Uh, one thing you could do is just uh, do hard singular value position. Um, don't do other things because, okay, I'll discuss that in a second. So let's do hard singular value consulting. You want to do matrix estimation, which provides you uh, a good error, a good estimation, error, good error on estimation with respect to your uh, to infinity norm, rather than Frobenius norm. Because if it's Frobenius norm, you won't get any good guarantee. Then actually, experiments do show that sort of, that choice actually makes a difference. And either you do non-parametric version, it works really well, or you do hard signal value threshold thing. Don't do what's called soft one because soft one doesn't have those uh, two pretty non uh, guarantees and actually it doesn't work. Then. So first you do matrix estimation. There's whatever data you have with missing values, denoise it. So now we'll say you've got hopefully low rank structure. Now you do regression, the classical ordinary least squares. That is, think of this as labels up to this point. This as labels and denoised matrix, these columns as features, and just do least squares. And then just do prediction. I think these as features for, uh, so step two and step three is what uh, was proposed in this without doing matrix. So this is denoising, and if you know PCR, this is PCR, right? PCR with uh, uh, doing uh, the principal component and then short. Right? That's the hard, uh, hard similar value. You took your feature, so like, what is PCR? It's a principal component regression. It says that you take your feature matrix, you compute its principal components, and it's usually in PCR you would assume it is in classical version, you will assume their values are not missing, but just a, a matrix, you compute its principal components, project it on those principal components. Now you got lower dimensional representation. Once you got that lower dimensional representation, on that you do regression. Once you find the regressed vector, whatever that is, you actually you can project it back. There's do inversion of the PCA to actually learn the feature vector, the, the model in the original space. Now it turns out it's not hard calculation. As soon as I'll say it will become obvious that this way of doing regression is identical. I mean, it's exact, is the where you take the original matrix of features, you do hard singular value thresholding, that is only keep the number of components that you kept in your PCR, okay, and then replace it by this new matrix, and then do uh, uh, learn the, uh, do the linear regression. Now these two are equivalent, not in terms of the model that they will learn, because there is model is ill-defined in some sense, it's not unique, but they will be identical in terms of predictions that they will produce. You assume this feature, this, this uh, model. Um, well, at some level, sort of all we're saying is that there's a time. So, okay, so whatever metric that you're looking here, right, is a, some function of latent features associated with the specific donor and some, and the latent feature associated with time. And it's the same function applied to the entire, uh, and this is the standard, the uh, special case of that as I was describing the linear version with uh, rank two version is the standard econometric structure. That's correct. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's just prediction. It's not uh, learning anymore. Okay. And uh, so, because of this kind of structure, uh, 
uh, this kind of structure, what you can argue, see here assumption was that there is actually a nice linear model, right, that actually predicts this well, uh, ignoring noise. Why should that be the case? Because it, there should not be a good linear model like this. What you can argue, uh, under this model, what you can argue is that um, if you choose any row at random, then uh, with a very high probability, it will have such a linear, uh, uh, linear predictor. Okay, and that's what sort of means the existence of synthetic control. So like most of the literature in synthetic control uh, in econometrics assume that, started with the assumption that there exists synthetic control. Our point is that actually in this kind of model, you don't need to assume it exists by that. It's an, it's, you don't need to have that as an axiom. You can just, you just don't define it. It's, uh, it's a deduction. Okay, and then what you get is, uh, effectively you're trying to analyze this PCR method, and uh, once you use this kind of method, use the estimation error, put it together, then you will conclude that the error that you get in training and the testing, so to speak, the training would be, uh, so testing would be training plus something, plus something scales like, uh, you know, requires your pre-intervention time to scale four times, or R to power four. This is the fraction of missing values, and this is the number of uh, donors and total time interval. And this one is saying that this is how your training happens. So in some sense, you want the amount of data that scales logarithmically in your number of uh, number of donors and polynomially in your model complex okay. and inverse polynomially in your fraction of observed. Uh, and again, as I said, you, what you want is you want a method that has very good estimation uh, with respect to this error metric. You have this scale. And HSVG is one. Okay, so I'll give you sort of one um, uh, one another application, and going back to the retail, which at least motivated us. Uh, and these are, let's say, weekly sales transaction of let's say a specific product that you care about, a pair of jeans or something. And these are same thing, but at different stores. And now we want to forecast this, predict this. So there is a very nice Walmart data set that they released on Kego a few years back. It's a very large data set. It was for competition. So you can, and it's for three years. So this index here is in weeks, so as we know, uh, 50, roughly 50 or so weeks per year, so 150 or so weeks in total for three years. And we said we'll take, let's say, a given store, one, department number 56, so think of different categories of uh, products, and then look at the sales and weekly sales, and this is normalized number that goes something like this. Gray is the actual thing, uh, blue is what we fit as a head control. This is where intervention happens, and we say, well, let's extrapolate, and this is the extrapolation. This is the extrapolation there. Depending on how you believe uh, this is at least visually reasonable example. Then you can ask the question, okay, I waited for such a long time and did this. What if I have very little data? What if I want to predict what's going to happen in the uh, entire future of three years but by looking at, let's say, first 10 weeks of data? So here's that experiment, 18 weeks. So you're fitting amazingly well, right? But terrible predictions. In particular, I want you to notice that these two are same thing, okay? And the reason they're visually looking very different is because the scale here is the scale. It's like super zoomed out. This is not working at all. That means that if we have little observations, uh, this is going to overfit and it's not going to work. And uh, if you think about, say, in setting of cricket, and you are observed 10 overs and you're observed for the rest of 40 overs, you're in, usually in this set, not this set. This is like 48 over. I think what's going to happen in the future, sure. I mean, anybody can do that. Uh, 
Um, so I mean, again, so the, what you do when you have limited data, going back, that one option is do some regularization, so the overfitting doesn't happen. But you know, only so much data is going to happen. Only so help only so much. And when you do uh, principal component regression, it has implicit regularization property, both in terms of bridge and uh, not so like. Uh, so it's not going to help really. So then you say, okay, if algorithms don't work, let's go to the source. Let's get more data. But I just told you, you don't have data. Say, so, okay, I don't have data for the things I care about. Maybe I have data for something that I. Uh, that might be related. It's like, I want to figure out what happens to crime rate. Maybe I don't have crime rate data, but I have high school dropout rate, or I have, uh, you know, tobacco sale or alcohol sale or something like that. Or, as one would expect, weapons. Right? Uh, yes? Uh, so, like, So, okay, good. Uh, so in some sense, you're not doing time series modeling, okay? I just want to make sure that what you're, what's happening is that there is a time series structure within the data across other donors, and you're just extrapolating it to this one. In some sense, you're doing, uh, if you think of this data as a space-time data, what you're doing is space version of it, not the time version of it. So again, the only reason you're able to do that is because Maybe there's a periodicity in other observations. Like, around Christmas, sales goes up no matter which store you're talking about. Okay, so uh, here's what we'll call the, the multi-dimensional version of this. And our view was that, well, look, here's one metric that you care about. And I, these are my donors. This is time. Why don't we have another other metric? And so now I've got a matrix. Now it has become a tensor. And it's three-order tensor, or depending on. And so, uh, let's sort of, sort of figure out what to do. So here's the algorithm. Okay. So first, I'll give you algorithm, and then I'll <coughs> explain you why it makes sense. So I had uh, this. I simply flatten it, and flatten it along the dimension of the donors. That is, I had these matrices, so I'm stitching by. Uh, this is time dimension replicated now. Donors are, east. the units remain the same, and these are the sort of different metrics. Right? So this is the metric that I cared about, but now I've got like more data, virtually. Okay. And now I do exactly what I did before. That is, a interventions, remove the, inter so okay, before I intervention, first look at all the gray parts, do matrix estimation and all of that, be noisy. Then chop out the pre-intervention part. On pre-intervention part from here, from here, and here, learn one linear model. Okay? And then use that to for this one just to do forecast. So effectively, I took my 10 weeks of data, and if I had sort of seven different types of product sales, I multiplied from 10 to 70. Uh, artificial periodicity, also, you know, I'm just sort of blindly saying that the data for shoe cell looks like data for uh, uh, gene cell. And why should that be true, right? And I'm so retaining the same. So, okay, so I need to justify that, and more importantly, whether I justify it or not, does it work? Okay, so that's actually a more important question. So let's do answer that. Okay, this was before, this is after. So all we did here is uh, we used 12 different other departments. There are 80 total departments. We used 12 departments, and we chose them carefully. And I'll tell you how we did that. Through. So you have one, one department that you care about, 56, that total 80 or so different departments. We went through each one of them and decided to accept or reject sequentially. And there is a simple uh, test I'll show you, which uh, helps you decide, accept or reject. And that actually is related to how, why we believe this should work. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, so let's say visually, 
depending, let's say this is the, actually this is really bad, so let's ignore that. I can sort of make, want to make a good point. So let's say this is a reasonable representative error. So maybe, uh, maybe 500 or so. So you are on the scale of, uh, depending on, let's say, uh, 10,000. These are point estimates. Yeah, you can get error marks. So I'll show you theorems. Great. Oh, you actually asked a, a theoretical question, not actually quantified this. Good, sorry. Okay, so uh, so here are the questions, right? Why why could you do? Why should you do this? And uh, by how much does it improve the performance? That's the first question. Because at least visually, we found that it seems like it's doing. Oh, it's de definitely doing way better than this one. So what is that improvement? Can you quantify it? And more importantly, I mean, I, should we, should, I mean, it's like sort of, this is like a Stein's paradox, right? Should the flying of the butterflies help me sort of predict the sort of what is the baseball batter's sort of performance going to be? Yeah, I mean, Stein would sort of to make a story or Afrin more particularly. Say, yeah, yeah, of course, it could help you. But when you boil down to practice, you want to sort of make sure that sort of you can decide what is noise and what is signal, at least for the to some large extent. So here is the model that we're using. So remember, this is two dimensional, this is three dimensional. So you take the hypothesis here is that, our hypothesis here is that the observations that you care about are a noisy version of the ground truth, where ground truth is some latent function applied to features associated with, don features with units, time, and the metric that you care about. And if this is there, then with the same uh, same abstract nonsense argument, you would convince that this is approximately low rank and approximately low rank in the way I had written the tensor yesterday. And uh, so let's say, in fact, it would say that this entry of that tensor is some low rank R. These are my singular values. This is my... Uh, uh, component related to the units, time, and metric. <coughs> now, if you look at this, and uh, if you, let's say, this is the target factor, this is the target's latent feature, a linear, linearized version, then uh, synthetic control says that this is effectively a linear function of other target, other features. And if I believe in this linear model, all that says is that my, let's say, me, the target, trick K is a linear function of other targets, sorry, other units for time J metric K. But the point is this beta does not depend on K. It's K independent. I mean, it's the same linear relationship. Okay. And that's why stitching them together should help you. Uh, and here's the theorem you can prove. It's the same theorem as before, but you get K here. And K is the number of different metric that you have access to. So that means that if K is one, you recover the original uh, uh, synthetic control. And if you have K 20, now your sort of data is effectively pre interpreted data is multiplied K times. Uh, and post intervention, it's going like, error is going down like one over square root of it. In some sense, uh, this is, we hope this is, this is exactly as good as it gets. All right, so now, the te what is the test we use to determine sort of which to include and which not? Very simple, you stitch this together, you look at the spectrum of this, and you get the spectrum of this, produce some kind of sort of, uh, 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 the way so we use the test is that, Look at the ninety. Look at the number that sort of you have in the ninety percent of uh, energy contained. If that number doesn't change by uh, more than one, then include it. If it changes by more than one, you discard it. Okay. So um, okay. So let me just sort of give one second. Uh, okay. Let me go through this cricket version now in last four minutes or so. So how does this go for cricket? Well. Effectively, uh, our view was that, look, this is the ongoing cricket game, and this is where you are in the game's situation. Let's say 30 overs are done, 
20 more to go and I don't know what to do. Intervention or not, all I'm doing is forecast, right? So forget, sort of forget inference. It's all about forecast. So if you go to forecast, these are all the historical games uh, trajectories. Just stack them up. And I know what happened before 30 over and after 30 over. So now let me just do what we do well. And what's my, well, I want to do MRSC, that is runs and wickets. Because it's already remember, right, sort of uh, 242 for nine is very different from 242 for one, right? And uh, it's easy to sort of, uh, easy for all of us to understand. So, yeah, because it's just beautifully stacked. So, yeah, reconfigure. I'll, uh, if, if you want to play, I'll sort of uh, point out a web portal that we have. It's called cricket.mit.edu. I'll, I'll show you. All right, so just to sort of, uh, this is India, Australia, let's say, game. This is, uh, I think this is numbers from um, quarterfinal, uh, quarterfinal in which the India won the World Cup in 2011. Um, and let's say these are those uh, trajectories. Um, okay, so this is the current inning, and this is what you want to forecast. The first, what we did, so these are all the, um, there are uh, thousands of ODI international uh, one day sorry one day international games that are out there. We took all of them uh, and created this matrix. We got sort of a score matrix, and you can look at its spectrum, and this is how it looks. It is really a low rank matrix. Then we say, well, okay, runs matrix looks like this, wickets looks like this, and when you put them together, it looks like this. So okay, this passes the visual test. So let's include the wicket. And then uh, if you want to play with this, this is only on historical data. We are still working to get the live feed. Apparently, everybody wants money for that. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to be nice to academics in this world. Uh, so we're still trying to sort of convince some people that, you know, it's nice to let people sort of play with it. Uh, if you know how to get live feed or scores, please let me know. Uh, so go to cricket.mit.edu, uh, click, click on applications. Um, you can look at past game. Let's say this is that game that I was talking about. Um, we want to avoid sort of, as soon as we first released this, lots of APIs started hitting us. I don't know, maybe somebody's doing gambling there. So we have a captcha. So it's kind of annoying if you use it as a user. So if you get annoyed, my apologies in advance. Uh, so here is one uh, thing I'm going. Sh I'm showing a snapshot. You can sort of decide where. Sorry, you can say where this one. You go further down. You can decide the sort of the when you want to intervene and so on and so forth, which inning and so on. So and let's say one of them will lead to this is the true trajectory. You're intervening at 35% um, or 35 overs, 70% 35 overs, and uh, here is the true. Here is the denoised predicted data, right? and this is what happens actually. Now, of course, I've, I've chosen this nicely so, for what it was. Um, and this was the actual score, and this is what you get predicted score. It's a, okay. Intervention is, um, uh, it's not intervention, it's like lack of knowledge. Like, let's say you are watching this game live, and uh, now that I have a uh, benefit of hindsight, I can very fine. Then you say, well, okay, great, 35 overs worked great, so let's see what happens at 30 over. Because we say, okay, let's go to 30 over, right? This is what the situation was. Still looks similar thing, right? So you got similar fit, it's denoised, so you'll have some error, but that's it. What's the forecast? Oops. Uh, this is, this is, there's a visual gap there, and that's not good, actually. So what happened? And now you and I sort of can go back and say, okay, did the method fail or what happened? Okay, now, this is a subjective interpretation. Does any one of you remember this game? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the one where in India won. And you know what happened here? Actually, Australia was going great guns. No, this is this is Australian inning, sorry. So Indian bowling. Here's what happened. Zahir Khan took two wickets in one over. 
That was a crucial over. Okay. So it's like if you are generating highlight, this is how I would generate highlight. I'll sort of move this around and I'll see where sort of the, my prediction fails, assuming that my predictions are working, right? Or your prediction. And then you do the usual thing, do all the statistical tests, find R square. R square looks like this. If you are at 35 hour predicting for the final score, you get 0.9. If you're, uh, sorry, you are at predicting at 30 overs for the 35th over score, you get R square, nine, so on. The, and uh, it's, it's almost like a Stein's paradox, right? For example, I could have done the same thing by only using the, as donors England's, England's trajectory. Okay, if I do only England, this is, this is the error I get. And if I use all innings, this is the error I get. The smaller the better, right? Like 3x better. So something like Stein's paradox is happening. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Sorry? Okay. We didn't do that, but actually that's a good suggestion. So I think one of the questions that remains, uh, 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 at least I, we don't know how to uh, understand really well, is uh, how do you sort of, so we, I told you how to sort of do this, which my auxiliary data to include or not, by through this uh, rank preservation test, so to speak. But maybe it would be nice if something like that was there at a very high level to think about what sorts of donors to include or not first and then filter them out. Because if you include them, and if you have limited data, it adds so much noise that you're, by the time you recover signal, the noise overwhelms you. So doing that is potentially useful. I don't have money. <laughs> no, this is pure academic. But I mean, if you know somebody, and if you, <laughs> if you want to sell so that they can sponsor our workshops, Let's do that. <laughs> okay. I see. I thought it was okay. Okay. You must be right. <laughs> there, there, are f there are a few really interesting. Uh, open uh, systems available, like there's a, uh, something that's, I think, spun out of Google folks that does Cricklytics or something. Yeah, so Crickinfo came up with something, and then my collaborator Vishal Mishra was this, uh, he has his own opinions about it, so I'm not going to share it on this camera. Yeah. <laughs> it's their right to do the... <laughs> Yes, yeah. yeah, so no, well, so the, for example, um, uh, this, uh, going back to, okay, uh, going back to this, um, uh, this study of um, uh, impact of legalizing, let's say, marijuana in uh, states, the data is so limited and also it's very noisy and it's many of them are missing entries. Uh, there actually, this method seemed to work really well, at least on short, short amount of cross-validation data. And there are a few other settings where we find that it's working out. Because in some sense, decision to intervene is not really impacting how I learned the models so far, right? But so if, if it's, it's a feature associated with the time component, then it should not change really. If, if, if we maybe sort of, uh, if, if we can follow up offline, and I would love to sort of see if at least what your data looks like. If nothing else, I'll learn something. Exactly. Yep. Uh, no, we have not done it, but I think that's a great suggestion. 
yeah, so I think um, um, as, um, as uh, Sandeep sort of uh, mentioned earlier in the, the, my introduction, Dream 11. So Dream 11 has this thing uh, where fan code, where they have some of these crowdsource thing, which they get in real time. So we're trying to see if we can actually integrate that so that we can do real comparison for ourselves, forgetting sort of uh, what world cares about. And uh, because I think the data is an issue here, and uh, my view is that if I'm an academic, I'm not going to pay for it. Because I don't, have, I don't have grants that pay for my data, and I don't want to raise them. That's good. That's good. The propensity score matching was sort of the precursor of uh, synthetic control. Good. Exactly. There's a whole, uh, yeah, there's a huge literature. Actually, Alberto is, um, okay, so maybe self advertisement. So Alberto and I decided that sort of there's a, econometrics has huge history and machine learning has interesting history. So we, uh, we've been sort of trying to work together to both educate, primarily educate myself, uh, for the last eight months. And, uh, that has led us to, uh, we're going to do tutorial at NIPS this year, so where our hope is it will put all of these things together. And then uh, hopefully it will sort of help draw some connection. Uh, correct, correct. So again, sort of uh, that's why I sort of, uh, I mean, I'm not sort of, I'm not an experimental slash empirical economist, so I don't do that full time. So I have to rely on the data collected by other experimentalists. Uh, there's a very active group at MIT uh, that's by uh, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo and all, and they have a very rich data sets about sort of variety of field experiments that do in Indian set uh, in India. So some of those we are actually applying this and uh, See, this method sort of applies for when your intervention is one or zero. What if I have interventions of seven different types? Actually, in the Abhijit and SL setting, it's a thousand different types. So one way to sort of go about it is to, instead of looking at this as a three order, look at four order tensor, and then do something more. And it works beautifully on that data. And you can actually do cross validation on that. But again, this is, you can sort of argue that the methods used there were terrible, and now you can use this as an approach. And so I don't think that there's a doubt in terms of broadly synthetic control-like world approach will work. I think the question is that how well and how uh, generalizable it is. I think there are lots of people have lots of doubts. And I think it's going to get settled maybe in the next year or not. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, if you, if you can do regression, you can do everything, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, if you do regression, you can do everything. Basically, whether it's synthetic control, whether it's... I mean, you have to, you have to believe in Bayesian philosophy. If you don't, then so can't. Yeah, so... Um, Okay, if you do bootstrap, then that's one way to build confidence. So if you believe that sort of your model was some kind of Gaussian stuff, then they will be just Gaussian. I mean, it takes sort of all existing technology stitches together. <laughs> and then you, depending on which faith you come from, you use that technology. I don't have faith. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>